intros. Okay, so yeah, so this is recording now, I think. So hi everyone, I'm Kira. Um, maybe I've seen some of you before around these kinds of spaces. Um, this is the, I think, 20th um, meeting of the Visual Tools group. So we're just gonna go over some kind of community updates um, today, hear from a few people uh, what they've been working on and and then stick around for some discussion. So um, yeah, so I'm Kira, I'm a software engineer, I mostly do um, like web development in Clojure, but I kind of am adjacent to all this data stuff through my most recent gig and um, yeah, just kind of kind of all all into closure. So um, I will just maybe like go around. We can do, I find sometimes it works well with these types of like big Zoom meetings. If you just like, you nominate the next person to go. So when, just maybe introduce yourself like really quickly, a few seconds, what, what, who you are, what you do, um, what brought you here. Maybe I guess where you are. I'm, a, I'm on the East coast of Canada. Um, so I know we're, we're kind of all spread out everywhere. Um, so I'll say, I'll, I'll pass over to Daniel. Oh, hi, uh, I'm Daniel. I'm a community organizer at Cyclos, at the Cyclos community, and I'll pass it to Tim. Uh, I guess we've got two Tims here today, but I'll jump in as, as one of the Tims. Uh, um, Tim from Australia originally, but um, I'm living in the US now. So if you hear a funny accent, it's because uh, I grew up in Australia. Um, and uh, I really love diagrams, specifically graphs. Um, I think they're super powerful. Um, so I'm a self-employed uh, engineer just building a diagramming app called Hummy.app. And um, uh, yeah. Um, maybe I'll pass it on to the other Tim, <laughs> just to make it easy. Uh, good morning. Uh, I am the other Tim. Uh, I'm uh, a longtime programmer in Java and Python who is looking to uh, use Clojure for new projects. Um, and so I'm just interested in spaces where Clojure is a good uh fit uh, and I'm calling from uh, west coast United States uh, not on the actual coast I'm about an hour and a half from Silicon Valley in, inward uh, and uh, so I'm, I'm adjacent to it but I'm not actually in it <laughs> uh, and uh, I think what drew, drew me to Clojure in the first place is just that in all of the things I've written in Java and Python, I just found that the thing that would be the most vexing to try to find problems in is just like, hey, I mutated some stuff. <laughs> How did this filter through the rest of the logic? And um, wouldn't it be so much better if uh, mutation wasn't the default? Um, and uh, I learned that in a surprising roundabout way. Uh, I learned that from XSLT. Like I had um, a, a fair amount of uh, transformation, uh, XML transformation pipelines that I had built early on. XSLT was still popular. And uh, I always found it really refreshing that they just kind of did what you said that they should do instead of... Um, causing some weird uh, outcome. Uh, so I was like, wait, this, this is, this is a, a good model for computation. And that, that's how I discovered functional programming. <laughs> uh, okay, anyways, that's my story. Uh, who is next? Uh, let's see. Uh, how about Peter? Hi there. Uh, yeah, I'm Peter. I'm um, I'm uh, sometimes a member of this group, or sometimes uh, visiting these groups. My main interest is in in um, just picking up what you guys are doing uh, and uh, 
trying to understand how it relates to uh, to to Calva because I'm a Calva maintainer. So, but today I'm extra stoked to see what Wade has been up to. Um, and if I go right on my screen, it's Josh. Hey, uh, I'm Josh, and um, I'm on leave from Stanford. I'm doing um, undergrad and master's. Uh, I'm exploring the space of LLMs, the intersection of LLMs, PL, and HCI. So I end up meeting a lot of people in each disciplines. Um, besides the thing I'm showing today, I'm creating, I have a team of like 70 people that I gathered and we're creating 50 metaverse GPTs for a streamer. It's like a short, like a month and a half project. Um, so trying to merge these like pretty exciting fields together and trying to create like souls out of LLMs. Oh, and then um, Zegas, if you wanna go. Yeah, hi. I'm, yeah, I'm also uh, working in LLM generative AI fields, uh, building some open source around that. Uh, yeah, I'm long time uh, in, in closure, I don't know, 10 plus years. Uh, based in Lithuania, that's Northern Europe. Mm, what else? Yeah, uh, not not really into visual tools, but I saw a few of the familiar familiar faces from LLM community, and I thought, okay, that's an interesting intersection to to check it out. And apologies for I will not be staying till the end because I have to some other things to do, so we'll drop out at some point. Uh, Sid five nine seven, please. If you are here. Okay, then Phoenix, not Phoenix, Phonix. So I don't know how to pronounce. <laughs> yeah, that's you. Hi. Hello. Uh, yeah, I've been in the closure space for around maybe like eight years or so. I came in fairly unconventionally because um, I didn't really study programming. Um, or have anyone like teach me so i just like uh, wanted to find a good language so i found out that lisp was good so i decided to like learn that from the beginning um and yeah worked in a bunch of interesting things like on data hike and everything and have generally found it difficult i think because my because of my unconventional background um to like find work so i've been like studying markets and everything. I've been also playing around with like LLMs. So the thing I'll be presenting today is a tool around sort of like time series analytics for financial markets. Um, and also maybe talk about like how I'm going to integrate LLMs into that. Uh, uh, Daniel? Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Phoenix. So um, everybody can hear me? Is my sound on? Yep, we can hear you. Yep. Yeah. Um, my name is uh, Daniel. I'm from Tel Aviv. Um, I'm doing closure for a long time. Um, and I'm going to show um, the build tool that I'm uh, working on, uh, which is also a, um, it's like half a, a combination of a build tool and a programming environment called Maven. Um, and I was showing, uh, I will be showing today a part, a small part of uh, what can be done with it in relation with uh, closure script and npm de dependencies and uh, yeah that's that's you're gonna hear more uh, soon so who didn't paddy maybe uh hello so i've been a fan of lisp for years i think i was at i know i was there for 2007 or 8 rich hickey's first talk at lisp nyc uh, about closure um I'm not hacking on closure now, but I am building something with 
I'm building a table widget with a very small Lisp that lets me go through pandas commands because it's easy to manipulate Lisp with JavaScript. Um, but this is a closure meetup, so I'm interested in what you all are building. And the Lisp community is always just so innovative and exciting and just it's the type of computing I want to see versus like, oh, more types and you just type more stuff and like it's elegant. So I'm really excited to see what everyone's building here. Oh, um, oh, Olav left. Um, Adam? Yes. Hello. Uh, uh, my name is Adam. Uh, I'm a uh, backend dev. I'm using Clojure to power a data platform called iData, which aims to activate the role of uh, data in the private sector in like where I live in Iraq. Uh, I'm here because I'm interested to see what's up with like uh, the current state of uh, LLMs and Clojure and visual tools. And yeah, uh, I, I want to pass it to Pollock. That's my um, second <laughs> that's my oh, okay. yeah okay then what does that uh i think peter did not go no peter went so james i think didn't go hey yeah they don't let me out too often um thanks for the pass uh i guess you could say i'm a sit down keep comedian who sometimes write some code uh I'm a bit of a love-hate relationship with closure but i love talking with y'all and finding out what's hot um and combining things that never should have been combined into the in the first place into a single system um i suppose the most useful way that i can uh, add value to any of you is if you like the intersection of Python and Clojure and Java, you should check out libpython.clj and hit me up if you have any questions about it. Uh, that's it. Thanks. Great. I think that is most people. Maybe we haven't heard from the Gimantas. No, all of his last. last oh, no, we did. Oh, yeah. that you're doing better than me and keeping track. Uh... Yeah, Olaf, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Do you want to do a little quick intro? Yeah, quick intro. Uh, I worked two years. You can hear me, by the way? Yep. All right, great. Yeah, I worked two years doing web development enclosure, just your average full stack kind of gig enclosure. And then now I'm doing indie hacking. I'm trying to make my own uh, SaaS and sell them and make money that way. And currently just, currently that's what I'm trying to do. And I'm just Good here to you. talk about LLMs and visual tools. So, yeah. Okay. That's awesome. Good for you. Um, okay. This is great. Super interesting group. I think we've got like every corner of the earth covered too. So that's fun. Um, it's amazing that we found a time to meet also for, so first of all, appreciate everyone like getting up early slash staying up late. It's like 11 o'clock for me. So it's a very convenient time. Um, maybe not so much for everyone else, but, um, yeah, I mean, I guess we can just dive right in. I think we had thought maybe Josh, you could, uh, go first. If you yeah. want to go with your, your 10 minutes, I'll let you know when it's, when it's almost yes. over. Make nine, please let me know. Perfect. Thanks um, so much. I think what could be interesting, one second. Let me. So, LLMs, HCI, and PL, right? I think there's a lot of like intersection between or like overlap between PL and HCI. That's like a general, like philosophical thing. But there's actually not much overlap between LLM and PL and also LLM and HCI from what I've noticed, right? So I've talked to- Maybe I just really quickly, just to make sure everyone's on the same page, could you just say what those acronyms are, LLM, PL, and HCI, sure, sure. just in case we have anyone sure. on the call or who's watching who's not, not familiar? Right, so I'll, I'll start with um, PL. So like PL, programming languages, right? So, you know, P, uh, programming language theory, um, my main is so like closure, like Agda, like Haskell related things. Um, fourth, 
like sad-faced language is right now. Um, I'll explain what that is. Uh, HCI is human computer interaction, right? Thank you for helping me clarify. HCI is human computer interaction, so design, breadth vector, visual tools, um, that kind of stuff. And then uh, LLMs are large language models, basically these like ChatGPT generative language models, right? And I think there's a huge potential in bringing them together. But even at OpenAI, it doesn't seem like there are people who are well-versed with visual tools or PL or HCI. So I spent like two and a half months um, basically reaching out to whoever I can in order to figure out like what's going on in this space because it felt like there was not much intersection. And there actually wasn't that much intersection, right? I went to Dev Day. There are very few people who are working in this space. So it's like the boring introduction to my, um, you know, to, to what I'm doing. So this is ChatGPT, right? I look at this and I think it's very limited, right? There's no programmability among strings, right? I can say like, a, hey, like, please write a factorial function. And it will do it, but I can't like, I can't like move these, right? I can't like, I can't even edit what's here. I can't like, I mean, this is like, the syntax highlighting is broken, but I can't edit what's going on in here. And I can't like make branches out of it. So I was like, okay, it'd be really nice if this was programmable. If I had the full programming language capabilities built into here, it'd be super nice. And very conveniently, there is a simple, elegant language, a set of a family of languages called stack based languages. And I'll, it's pretty easy. Um, so when I say please write a factorial function in closure, and this is the, the thing on the left is something I made. Then instead of doing this, I'm going to put quotations around that and it will make more sense why. And when I do that, it will not do the normal thing that is creating this but it will place the string onto the stack. So this is the stack. We have a single stack that we are working off of. Um, and you can do multiple things with it. So I can say LLM, which will consume the top of the stack. The stack has one element right now. So the top of the stack is please write a factorial function in closure. And it will send it to ChatGPT and bring, stream it back. So basically more composable atomic components um, that are that can build into something more complex. So let's do that again. You can see it's built in closure, right? Um, it's a little bug, but an Easter egg, we could say. So if I wanted the behavior, exact same behavior of this, where I type this and then uh, have this occur, then I need to do this then duplicate, you can also, you can see the preview of what's going to happen before the evaluation, right? So yes, it puts its answer at the top of the stack, right? So if I do something like this, it will place the place, please write a, a factorial function enclosure and then consume the top element. But if I don't want to consume the top element, but keep the prompt there, then I would duplicate it and then call element. So composition and fourth is very simple. You just place a space and then do the next thing, right? Okay, let's stop. So I can do things like, okay, I wanna swap these. Right, so I can easily swap. I mean, these are like very standard fourth things. Uh, let's do something more, more interesting. I can do something like, what is an apple? What is a banana? I can say, okay, duplicate this and send it to LLM, right? Duplicate just so that if I just do LLM, I'll lose this. I'll lose what is a banana. Okay. Right. So I can say, what is a banana? Duplicate LLM, right? And so this is like, we're trying to answer the question of what is a banana, but oftentimes in prompt engineering, what happens is that the answer that you get is not the answer that you want. 
So let's set the let's say that the answer that you want is a single sentence and not an entire paragraph. Right? So, so how what you can do is I'll speed this up a little bit and I can explain it later. Is I can say, okay, duplicate this, say answer in the sentence, or place the str string answer in the sentence, and then concatenate the top two strings and then send it to LLM. Right? So I'm going to duplicate what is a banana answer in the sentence, concatenate them and put it in an LLM. And you can see like the preview of what's going to happen in here. So it's, we're going to send that. Hey, like it, got, it got a single single sentence. So I can say, okay, um, answer sent, or let's just say do sent, simpler. So I'm defining a new function called sent, which will answer the question in as a sentence, I say, okay, send all clear. Now I can do something, okay, first, so first would bring what is an apple and then do send. So now I'm building up a vocabulary and since I don't have much time, I can like, I'll probably show more slowly usually, but just to show us like some more features. What is a graduate fruit? I can say, okay, I'm going to create a vector out of these, out of these four elements. And then I'm going to do, okay, I'm going to create a function. It's called a quotation in fourth, but I'm going to basically map sent, map create, like answer all these questions in a single sentence um, throughout all of them. So I'm going to say, okay, map. So I can see a preview of what's going to happen, right? So there's going to be eight elements now. The question, the answer, the question, the answer, the question, the answer. And then I'm gonna say, okay, now place them onto the stack, right? And like a visual tools component here is, you can see this is showing what's going to happen. I think there are more visual elements that can happen here where it shows what's changed. So if it's a swap, instead of like showing the static structure that is the result, it will show the animation of the swap, which I think is pretty cool, right? So if I do this, then it will run all of these in parallel, right? Usually something like this is pretty hard to express in Python, very annoying to express in LangChain and not as interactive. So I hope this platform becomes like a synthetic data set generation, as well as some place where people can sort of organically grow a vocabulary of commands where you can just be like, oh, like, you know, I have a bunch of questions. I want to just play with them. Um, I want to do evaluations over a over like a thousand different things. I want to do filter over a thousand different things. Because like for a lot of prime engineering things, you can express them using um, functional paradigms. So um, maybe I kept it a little too short, but um, yeah, this is basically what I'm building. And just as like a last thing, just as like a, just to show that this electric is amazing. <laughs> Oh, yeah, no, you're um, right on time. That's about nine minutes. So, okay. All right. So, so I'll, I'll say one last thing. Um, so, just to show that electric is amazing, this is built, this was built <laughs> a weekend in like 800 lines of code, 700 lines of code. Cool. And that was, that was about it. But, anyways, yeah. That's, that's super interesting. Super interesting. I think we have like a little bit of time after each one. Do you want to? Do you want to do the questions as we go, Daniel, or do you want to kind of wait till the end? No, I think it makes sense to have like a couple of short questions and then continue. Yeah, I was gonna say, I think just while we have, while we're in the context, this is really yeah. interesting. Thanks for sharing. Um, so yeah, I see one question in the chat. Did you write a fourth interpreter in Clojure? Yeah, so the this is the same one, the entire file with the front end and back end, right? And the interpreter is pretty okay. easy to write. Fourth interpreter is pretty easy to write. So, yeah, um, and I wrote like a okay. little nice macro to express. Right. You can see here, it's pretty easy to tell what's going on, right? Okay. It's it's not open source yet because I don't know, I'm, I'm I don't know I haven't decided. <laughs> I haven't decided yet, but I have a lot more features that I'm thinking about. I'm just not motivated to work on this. I'm doing other 
I'm building Discord servers instead of programming right now. So <laughs> the classic, <laughs> That's where, classic problem, yeah. man. Yes. That's cool. Does anyone else have any any like questions or comments, anything like that? Right away. Yeah, There'll be a little bit more time later, I think, too, but just while we're yeah. while we're right here. Oh, I'm also trying to get this to be embedded in Twitter so that you can use it on threads because threads are actually, yeah, so, because threads are actually stacks as well. Stacks are everywhere. I mean, lists, stacks are lists, right? Yeah. So you can treat it. <laughs> yeah, programmers, just every everywhere you look, all you see is like data organized in different ways. Yeah. It's funny. Exactly. Um, no, this is super cool. Super cool. Awesome. Well, thanks for sharing. Um, yeah, like I said, there'll be a little bit of, of time after, but um, I think we have another electric one. Maybe we can move on for, for now to uh, Phoenix. I see something about uh, electric, JS time series analysis, that kind of stuff. That sounds super interesting. So it's cool to see the, like, because I remember when electric came out, it was, it was kind of like interesting, but like, what is this? And it's really interesting to see people using it. I'm excited. Cool. Uh, let me figure so, out. Yeah, perfect. Mm. But yeah, same thing, I guess. Feel free to take take time getting set up, and then we'll kind of do ten ish minutes and, and a minute, a couple minutes after. I think it might be easier to share the screen. Yeah, I that's fair. Thanks so much. Okay. Um. Cool. Can everyone see the screen? Cool. Um, yeah. yeah, so I, so this is like a trading view, which is kind of the main platform that people use to like study different markets uh, these days. And this is the one that I've taken a lot of inspiration from, uh, but the, the platform is just like, it's just super feature heavy and the notification system is like really bad. So I decided to uh, build my own thing. Um, and as a reference point, this is also the other professional thing, which is kind of like stuck in the the nineties. Um, and yeah, kind of, this is what I've built at the moment. And yeah, it's a uh, built in electric and Pixie JS and TechML data set. And initially I had used a SVG, but it just didn't have the performance uh, for like really kind of being able to uh, render a bunch of uh, a, a bunch of elements. Um, yeah, and never really presented anything before, so this is new for me. Um, yeah, I've recently added uh, the ability to uh, add like some indicators. Uh, I'm still working on that. And like to kind of be able to, you, ca you can't do this in TradingView or any other platform. It's kind of very like manual and you just add in the number and then just wait for it to update. And basically my interest is doing it like real time uh, technical analysis across these and then being able to have AI assist you with finding uh, the best fit for these numbers, for these indicators across different assets. And then a lot of people are building uh, machine learning models to, to study like financial markets and like find these uh, different strategies. Uh, but it kind of, you build that and it's kind of, there's no real observability in it. What I'm very interested in is having something where I can just like click a button and it's like running the simulations and I can actually be watching the these moving averages uh, change in real time. Um, I can also do it myself so I can find patterns and then uh, tell it uh, like as, as I'm doing it, I could be seeing like how well these these affect uh, the trading strategy just by like running a slider across it. Um, yeah, and at the moment, I mentioned that it's built in Pixie.js. Uh, I'm probably going to rewrite that at some point uh, in WebGPU because Pixie.js I'm like using very minimal 
uh, stuff from it and it's kind of a fairly old project i've been looking at web gpu and it's kind of doesn't seem like it would be that much uh to do it and i might get a lot of extra benefit from doing that um yeah is there any kind of questions i don't really know what else to, to talk yeah, about so i have a question yep so is this um what you're doing basically is called back testing is that correct uh no it's more like actually being able to study the market and what it's doing at the present moment okay so i'm actually very I, i'm not very interested in doing uh back testing i'm actually interested in what is the market doing what what is the expression of the market in this moment oh okay so not strategies you know it's not about uh seeing what strategies will result in what uh but more what is the market doing today now yep okay Great. Cool. Where does the data come from? Like, how is that? That's just part of electric. Like, does electric, I've never used it before, so I just have no idea how it works. Does it have like a mechanism built in or is it really just like, like you're so electric, it and somehow feeding it to the, mm -hmm. to the UI? Yeah. Thanks for that. Uh, yeah. So electric actually really, uh, it's just like the transportation layer. So it's just like yeah. allowing you to like move sh shuttle data and logic between the back end and front end very easily. Uh, like when I first started, I didn't understand uh, any of these scaling functions. Um, and I looked at, I, I can't really read JavaScript uh, that much. So I was like looking at D3 and not understanding what was going on. So I used uh, the scaling library, the, I think it's with Doga or something. And I was actually doing this, uh, but deferring it to the back end to calculate the scaling. Um, and at the moment, it's also, I've got a, design for like buffering in the data um so that it's not kind of rendering all of the data and this will be a lot faster once um at the moment there's a then there's an issue with running a uh, tmdjs like tecmo data set uh in the front end uh so i have constructed it in a way where i'm actually using the back end at the moment um, and once it's once that's fixed, then I can just like switch that to using that in the front end. So I'm using electric for just easily moving data back and forth between the front end and back end. Oh, well, um, that's really cool. Can you tell a bit about the data? Where does it come from? Uh, this data here is fetched from Polygon, um, which is a like data supplier for financial market data. Um, okay. and I, I also plan to like plug into like actual exchanges. Is it possible to do this uh, without, uh, uh, subscriptions or is this uh, data available for free or do you have to pay for it? Uh, they do have free. Um, it's just usually metered. Like it's like five API requests per minute or something. Um, yeah, uh, uh, this here, uh, is actually like using WebSocket. So each minute this is updating. Um, and I'm, I think they also have second like information. So I'm going to be using that and like for, for the more real time stuff and like, uh, more like further data back. So you know, they go back two years data for, for an exchange, um, on the free account, but on a paid account, you could go back 10 years. Cool. Thank you. Uh, and it's all the entire, oh yeah, uh, on the topic of electric being amazing. Um, it's probably about 1,000, 1,200 line of code at the moment, which includes like all the ETL and everything, like all the front end and the back end. That's really cool. Or are you using Rama for this or no? Uh, I was really interested in using Rama, but then I realized that I can literally just use CSVs and Tecmo dataset. So um, at the moment, I'm just using a bunch of CSVs, and I'm probably just going to like put them onto S3. Nice. Um, uh, I think Rama will be really interesting when I start fetching um, actual tick data. Um, so when you hook into the the exchanges uh, with an API for tick data, it's like a every 250 milliseconds you're getting updates and i think rama is like a perfect use case for that what's like the heuristic 
for this? What's your heuristic for deciding or current heuristic for deciding whether this application needs to migrate to Rama or not? Um, hmm. uh, when CSV becomes slow to use. That, that, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Isn't the Rama like the 100 times less code uh, thing also interesting? Uh, yeah, Rama just uh, has a, it's like uh, what, the, essentially a log and then an index and then like materialized view, I think on top of that, or like a query over the index. Um, and the index is like materialized view. Um, and Rama seems like a really good use case for like, uh, when I'm like really streaming in, like if I'm wanting to hook into the exchanges and get get like actual tick updates of like what is the current uh, price at particular banks, um, I feel like Rama would be, the best for using that stream data. But yeah, like at, at present, like uh, I realized that I didn't need that um, at the moment. And like at the moment, this is actually very static because I'm just uh, figuring out um, there's a bunch of just data cleaning that needs to happen. So I'm just visualizing at the moment to be able to figure out like the data cleaning side. And that's why I haven't switched to web GPU yet because I, um, don't need that right now to actually figure out like the more data engineering aspects. You have questions in the chat as well. Oh, cool. Um, I can maybe, I don't know whether there's any value in actually screen sharing anymore. So I, I can read them for you if you like. It's okay. I can just answer questions. Mine got answered already. Uh, which, oh wait, uh, yeah, so thing I did look at, um, and I couldn't really figure out how to use it. So I, when I initially started, I, um, I couldn't figure that out. Um, and then I just decided to use like SVG, uh, just like raw SVG. Um, but it just wasn't, it didn't have the right performance for like rendering so many elements. Uh, SVG slopes of latency. Uh, SVG is just like interacting with the DOM. Um, Pixie JS is actually you're just like giving the data directly to the GPU. Um, and so you you're just computing all of the data that you want to render, and then just putting it in. And that's just way faster because the GPU is doing it. Uh, was there any other questions? I think that was it. Uh, how often does it update? Is it real time? Uh, not at present, but it will be. That's I would cool. like a uh, connected. Does it, to... Sorry. Does it refresh right now? Like, is it like a manual? Like you request new information and then it like updates, or how does that work at the moment? Uh, at the moment, the the chart is just like a static CSV that I I grab down. Um, and the oh, okay, gotcha. Uh. The stuff in the other panel, I have a little start subscription at the uh, at the top right, which will it will just be automatic at some point. Um, but the nice. the symbol list is actually uh connected to WebSocket, so I'll just be appending that to the data sets, and then through Electric, I'll it will be able to watch for the changes and just update it in real time. That's really cool. Yeah, and that being really simple, I didn't realize how simple it was going to be. Oh, the other thing I want to mention is a uh, trading view is like proprietary, um, and you have to like do through go through a whole application process and like have a business to like get access to their like charting tool. Um, right. So other tools in this space are like all proprietary. So I just it just it was easier to build it myself than to like try and figure out somebody else's tool. Um, it, this whole yeah. thing took me, I think, about ten uh, like two months of work to get it to the state. But is it a That's present really cool. project or do you plan to make a product out of it? Uh, it's just for myself. Okay. That's cool. If somebody wants some features and wants to pay me, that would be pretty cool. <laughs> Classic. Yeah. That's great. Um, 
Cool. I guess that's probably a reasonable time to, to move on unless there's any more questions or if anyone has any anything else to, to ask or say. We're making good time today. So I think next we were gonna hear from uh, Daniel, not Slotsky, um, about project templates. Thank you. I'm uh, going to try to share my screen. Uh, before that, uh, just a quick intro. I am uh, setting the context. I'm I'm building a tool, um, which which has no. It's a it's something that I'm do be doing for a couple of years, um, and it's called Maven, and it has uh, for me replaced uh, Lightning Gun and. Um, uh you know the the community uh, build tools so i'm i'm using something which is um a, a part and um uh i do this because uh I, I hate builds i just hate the builds and the builds i you know it's like the thing that is the most uh, time it's it's the most annoying thing i find when i program you know you you want to be you know code at the repl and doing uh, juicy stuff and and think and and solve interesting problems, and then you can't do any of it because you have build problems, <laughs> and and uh, that's horrible. So to solve build problems, um, you need to understand how the build works, of course, and you need a, a tool that you know how to use. When you when you use community tools, you don't really know it's it can be a um, uh, an obstacle for for your understanding. Uh, of both the build and and the build tool, so uh, this is why I find it important to to really uh, master that 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 thing. This is what I wanted, um, and 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 of course, um, it uh, it's something that is um, it touches on m several things. You have the build, but you also have the repl, and then. You have the the middleware. You have so many things. What today? What I want to show you is just one very sh uh, small corner of uh, Maven. One very small, tiny thing. That um, the reason I want to show you this is that uh, everybody can use it. It's like Maven is not open source. It's it's not something. It's not a public project, but it is freely. It's for free. You can you can use it for free. You can download and install it for free. So uh, I, I uh, if you like what you see, if you have the same kind of needs as me, then uh, for for, for uh, building uh, 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 closure script project in this case, because this is uh, what I'm going to focus on, then uh, you're welcome to uh, to try it out uh, or to use it. I mean, to use it for yourself. And it's uh, just a small corner, but it's very easy to use. And I hope it's very solid also. That's my hope. Uh, but of course, the demo gods are always a little bit uh, tricky. So we'll see what, what's... Uh... So the, sharing the screen, um, I hope I can do it without too much problem. So it's the desktop, right? I have to share the desktop, okay. So do you see my uh, terminal? Is this what you're seeing, uh, the terminal? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So. Sorry, that we see. Yeah, sure. So to to start, uh, so I'm not gonna explain how you install it because there's a website with instructions and everything. But uh, the the way you run it is uh, you tap Maven, M Y V N. The reason it's called Maven is because it's based based on Maven, the Java build tool, M A V E N. So. Um, you get a, a shell. That's a, a thing that uh, other build tools don't give you. It's like you have a, a UI actually. So, if if you are in a di directory with no closure products, then the only sensible thing to do is to show you templates uh, with which you you can install something new. That's uh, the directory is empty, so you, there's no closure. Probably you want to to start a closure project. So. Um, I, I, I'm going to let you tell me which one you want to see because based on the interest of uh, here, because uh, I can I can do any of it. Um, so if, I have here six projects. One, two, three. Yeah. So one very basic um, uh, project 
that will set up that will set up um, uh, a hello world kind of thing. Um, then we have a, a web project with uh, ring rated and um, all the, the facilities for the interactive development at the REPL. Then we have a React uh, project uh, with uh, ClojureScript and it's uh, CLJS.js. And finally, the most uh, troublesome builds are when you involve NPM because you have to, suddenly you have more commands and you have more uh, configuration flags in your build. You're, you're, building, you're working with basically NPM and the ClojureScript compiler. And they, you know, the, it's it's uh, it can be troublesome to to set up. So that's the last one. So you tell me, uh, what should I, what should we do now? This is really cool. Um, you want maybe you want to just like try one. There's still a few, a few minutes. Um... Yeah, you tell me what you want to see <laughs> because it's not. Sure, sure. It's not coding, it's just, uh, deploying the, the project. And that's that's what I want to show you. Sorry, what was that, Peter? Right. Show us the NPM one. OK, NPM. Good, excellent choice. So if you don't change this, you're going to use a default uh, name. I just didn't change because we don't have so, so much time. I'm uh, running ahead. So it's it's going to it's generating the project. And it's called Foo. Uh, this, this was the default. I don't know if you had time to see the, the small um, window, it said orgfu.bar. So it's uh, generating the project. And once it's done, we're gonna go and look at the directory. What's going on when it's right now? It's it's uh, downloading the um, the template from uh, from the internet. I hope everything is fine. It uh, takes a little bit. Uh, uh, it takes a bit of a while. I don't know why. Um, should be quicker. So it you so it's like pulling in like predefined templates and then yeah. modifying them with for what input you get. Yeah, like exactly. Name. Exactly. The templates uh, system is called Velocity. It's mm -hmm. an Apache uh, Apache project. And. Um, it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, the one that is used by Maven, the Java, the big the big tool. So it's industrial. Uh, it's, it's, it's very stable, very. St but th this is definitely not a, a normal. I don't know what's going on here. Um, this shouldn't take so long, uh, and I have no idea. Is my internet fine? Yeah, obviously. No idea what's happening here. Let's try it again. Oh. Always demo problems. <laughs> Maybe I have already, a, wait, let me check something real quick. Do I have a button? No, there's no. Okay, I don't know what happened. This Yay. is fine. There are more problems. <laughs> no, but uh, when you don't understand the problem, it's never good. Mm -hmm. I want to know what happened. But uh, okay, so so now uh, we can go to bar, and um, there is a, um, a directory structure, um, which includes um, everything that is needed to start uh, a closure. It's, a, it's basically a skeleton, right? For a, a, a closure script, both. I always like to, to, to serve the closure script with a closure uh, web server. I know some, some people don't, don't do that, but uh, I like to have one, one server, uh, a closure server in one process, which is going to serve the index file. And the other one, the which will be the the closure script compiler and the, the, 
the 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 rappel, the fig wheel. So um, when when you first, I'm going to start the the web server. I call this uh, testing. Ah. So the way you do, so there is a client uh, integrated with um, uh, Maven in Emacs, uh, which is called it's a it's a Elisp. It's you, so you just, what you do is Maven connect, and then you get to the um, the REPL, the N REPL, which is from the pro, from um, from within Emacs, and then okay, address already in use. So I have some. I have to <laughs> to close the. Uh, okay, I'm gonna. So okay, let me show you how you fix this. You go to Maven, and the the port number is is um at, in a in a in a configuration file called Maven dot Eden, and we're gonna write here three hundred eight hundred seventy five. So now we can do Maven system reset. Okay. Um, yeah, the port. Let me do it like this. Okay. Very interesting. Okay, maybe connect. Even system go. Okay, so now the server is up, and um, the what is left to do is to to start the 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 closure script repo, and in Maven we can do this with the fig wheel, and it's called the. Uh, but we there is actually um in this template there are three builds available one is fig wheel for development the other one is the official closure script um compiler then you would type in maven um, dash x uh, cell J, js and the third one is a production uh build which will make an uber jar uh with um the whole the whole the whole project uh so that you know when you deploy on a server you can just uh, run that that uber jar and that's that is actually very important because so uh, there is one thing that i i forgot to do because it's an npm um uh, uh there are npm dependencies after you install the the template you have to to install the dependencies npm install and then right. you can run the the fig wheel. That's the only thing I, I forgot. So um, yeah, so three the, the three the three builds uh, because again this is this is how I, I like to work. I don't want to to have a perfect uh, development um, environment, and then when comes the time to to deploy, uh, then I run into multiple issues. So th this is this is why we with over a long stretch of time i've refined my my way of uh, doing the techniques i use to uh, develop and to deploy and now it's very um disciplined so this is what basically i'm offering um you know if you're interested so you you can you can do this so this is uh oh address already in use that's because i have another instance of a um a fig wheel i should have here it is. Yeah, here I, I'm gonna close it down then and then here. Okay, that's another I, sorry about that. This is something I should have uh, thought about. I had um No, I was... no, it's <laughs> it's always how it goes with demos. Um yeah. that's about ten minutes. Is there anything else? No, um... just if you give me uh just 30 seconds more then I will uh, open yeah, yeah, of course. the website because we are building uh, what I want to show you based here. That's it. So now I can go to the browser and I can. Type in. 
it's a local host. And I have to three eight seven five three eight seven five. And voila, you have oh, here. That's so cool. So this is this is a a um, a project. This this is the skeleton. Now, I just just a quick word about what you get here. What you get here is an example of how to use uh, React with uh, Clojure Script Interop. So there is no. That's another thing that I would have loved to expand on, but. I don't like to use the wrappers for React because I think you can do in, uh, uh, React interrupt with Clojure Script in a very uh, elegant way. And the, if you, the more you study React, the uh, you will see that there are some gotchas, especially with um, how to work with effects. And there is a huge uh, uh, article on the React website explaining the gotchas and. And all the, the 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 corner cases and how to use use effect well, and basically this page in the skeleton, I have uh, you have examples of all these corner cases. Like this is exactly you know even uh, section by section of this of the official React tutorial of how to use um, use effect correctly. Then you know it's it's here. You can watch the code and see uh, how, 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 how it used. So the code is, is just here, right? So this is... That's so cool. This is the, the code. And as you see, uh, a, a component is just a function. That's, 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 mm -hmm. that's what it is. And uh, it has also, in the skeleton, you also have an amazing uh, um, WebSocket uh, library called Sente. So you can uh, mm -hmm. communicate with the backend. Uh, for example, here in the shared state, if I do an increment, I'm actually doing a um, back and forth with a server. But this is to show that it's so quickly you can't even you can't feel mm -hmm. you can't see any delays. It look it looks like a local uh, uh, because Sente is a web socket. You have a permanent socket, no overhead, and it goes quick. So this is really serious. Uh, very I, cool. I've done a couple of commercial projects with this, uh, with this, with this skeleton, and uh, yeah, that's it. So I know I've been over my time. Thank you for your patience. If if anyone has more questions, I'll be happy to. Yeah, no, this is super interesting. I can definitely, definitely see it being useful. Um, yeah, we can we can still totally take a couple minutes for for any questions or, or anything like that. If anyone has. Um, things they want to say. I think it's uh, looked awesome. That's what I want to say. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Coming from you, uh, it's a big compliment. Thank you very much. <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Yeah, this is always, this is always one of the things I found difficult about. Like, I guess I've been doing closure for a lot of years now, but whatever, five years ago before, like a lot of languages have these like, just like really easy CLIs where you're like, make a new project. and it's often not the case with Clojure. You spend the first two days like just yeah, setting yeah. out but that's it, that's where, where you would get to with like Rails new or something. So exactly, Clojure is know. moving parts, a lot of moving parts because we use with yeah. you, we're using libraries and you have to stitch them together. And the the more the more serious your project is, the more la uh, layers you will have, and it becomes really uh, uh, this this kind of what we call. Um, uh, not uh, how do you call this complex um, incidental complexity, right? It goes through the roof, mm -hmm. and the only way to 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 rein that in is by having a disciplined approach to it. Because the worst, you look, suppose you work on a project for one year and it become you know, and you've been solving the problems, the build problems, one after yeah. the other, bit by bit, and then after two years, you start a new project and you know that everything you, you have learned from the previous one would have come in handy if you only remembered what you did. Right? And that's... For that's sure. Oh, for sure, yeah. You yes. have to freeze this in a uh, in a template system, in a bit. It is... It's definitely tricky, for sure. Part of it is that, like, the ecosystem is still kind of evolving a lot. Like, I think if you look at, you know, how you would set up a new, a new web app in Clojure, like, four years ago versus now, I know, I know we do it differently, but... Um, yeah, it's interesting for sure, for sure. I guess there's there's one question there uh, from Mauricio. It's got some some noise from the rain, but um, just was wondering any reason to use fig wheel, fig wheel instead of 
shadow CLJS. So yeah, so the, the only reason is that I am I have also an approach for that. So I don't mm -hmm. I know I know shadow uh, I hear I heard a lot of good things about shadow and I'm 100% sure that it's it's a good tool. When I when I start uh, solving problems with closure script, uh, it was before shadow and for a long while I was using um, the I didn't need npm dependencies. Um, so I was using the CLJS JS so, uh, solution, which has a, a way of packaging all the dependencies uh, in, a, in according to the closure script compiler, uh, which is handy. But uh, it you had to go through this um, third party, basically a community effort to maintain mm -hmm. the these uh, closure script libraries in a packaged way. It, it was it, it was a lot of labor, manual labor, and there was tooling issues, and it be so then then uh we we got a way to closure script offered a way to work with npm now wh when i looked into it i saw that it worked and therefore i didn't need shadow sales a lot of people who who needed shadow a lot of people were busy working on something and found that shadow sales was solving a problem for them that they couldn't mm -hmm. solve with the normal closure script compiler. This was not my case. I could solve all my problems with the closure script compiler, first with CLGSGS, then with the NPM um, feature. So I don't need, I just mm -hmm. didn't get there. I don't need to get there. And if I don't need to get there, I'm not going there. That's all. But I'm sure mm -hmm. that people who use it is, it's great. I mean, but it's not, it's always, yeah. always, always, look, Shadow CLGS is uh, one, it's uh, Michael Heller. So, He's he's a, he's it's a one person effort or I don't know if probably there are contributors but I mean I always look also at um, working because the, the problem with uh, working in in open source is that a lot of times you you start using a library and then suddenly some may, something may happen so if I don't have to use libraries like the less the less I depend on the better it is so closure script compiler is the official de facto compiler and that's what I use so yeah. That's that's the the answer, but uh, yeah, good question. I'm happy that uh, yeah, you got. Uh, yeah. Uh, oh, can I just uh, complete something? Can you hear sorry? me? Because of the I can't hear you. Oh, sorry. We can barely hear you. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll send in the chat. <laughs> sure. Maybe just in the interest of time to make sure we hear from the other two, we'll uh, hold that thought and we'll move on to to Daniel. So it's, it is, it's so loud there, Mauricio. Um, just to to make sure we, we get them all in before the, the time's up and we can always stick around a little bit after if anyone has extra time to, to chat or, or ask more questions or discuss um, the pros and cons of all of the various CLJS compilers. Um, so yeah, I think we've got um, Daniel Sutsky with a little update on Kindly um, or whatever else. Uh, you yeah. want to talk about it, obviously. Yeah, thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. 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 yeah and, and, and yes, so what has happened was that a few months ago in this group, we were talking about this Kindly project, which is just a tiny project, but it was kind of important for our workflow. The idea of Kindly was to have a certain way to express how things should be visualized. And in a moment, we dive into it. Uh, but I'll just say that yeah, the, I've been slow in the last few months. And thank you for your patience. You know, a, a few projects were kind of dependent on this. Now I think things are maturing finally. And uh, Timothy and I have been collaborating and Timothy has affected me so much. And it, it was so nice to work as a team on, on this. On, and related projects that Timothy will mention. And finally, things have simplified and are just simpler than they used to be. And, and that's really thanks to you, Timothy. And then later, Timothy and Kira and I are, have started collaborating and we work as a team uh, and we meet regularly. And a lot of the things which are happening now and gonna be mentioned are thanks to this team with Kira and Timothy. And so I'll show the screen uh, very briefly. Sorry. 
So I think you see the editor and the browser and things are moving, but we'll settle in a moment. And so, right, we have this slideshow on the left. And that is a slideshow generated by one of the tools we'll mention, this clay tool for generating uh, visual stuff like slideshows and books and blog posts and other things. And um, this slideshow is generated by a namespace. And that is this common habit a few of us have. We call namespace as a notebook where we express a certain piece of documentation or visualization or visual report as a closure namespace. And the problem that we have discussed in the past was that there have been lots of tools for generating visual stuff like blog posts and visual books and, and slideshows and so on, visual stuff from closure code. And all those different ways are, were not just, com not exactly compatible because they, they were just a bit different in the way they stated how things should be visualized. So for example, this amazing old visualization uh, documentation by our friend Generate Me is, has been created by an old version of a tool we called Node Space. And you see the code here. And we did have back then a certain way to express how things should be visualized, like saying, this should be hiccup, this should be markdown, and all those specifications of visual formats. And then we just had all those other ways to create notes, visual notes, and they were not compatible. And what we want to do is have one way we can, uh, oh, sorry. am I stuck? Oh, yeah, sorry. We need to have one way to express how things should be visualized. One way that can be used for blog posts and books and slideshows and visual reports and dashboards and interactive analyzers. And that will work across different tools. For example, we work in Portal, this amazing data navigation tool, or in Calva Notebooks, this amazing uh, notebook in, a, in an editor experience, and other settings that we want things to work compatibly across these environments without having our namespace, without having to mention any specific tool in the namespace we're creating. We just want to create namespaces that will work across tools. And currently, is an attempt to solve that. And now it is this moment where it is ready. So it is supported by the tools called Clay and ClayKind. Clay is used to generate this slideshow. And ClayKind is another related project that Timothy will talk about. And uh, it is also supported by the more famous tools like Portal and Club through adapters. So if you write, your namespace by the kindly convention, then a portal user can use your data visualizations in your namespace if they use the kind portal adapter. And similarly for Clerk. And we will demonstrate a little bit of portal in a moment. And, and yeah, that is the moment we are ready to explore other tools like Calva Notebooks, which is very much related to portal. And like, you know, hopefully this future Pulsar editor. And so I'm so happy that both Peter and Maurizio are here. Thank you for making it on this. You know, I know the hour was not easy. And um, so here is an example. The idea is that we have a certain API with those functions like MD for Markdown. And this way we annotate things and say, this is Markdown, right? So that's basically, that's the kind of API. And and we, there is a certain set of kinds which are supported. And the plan is to stabilize this set and let it grow, but keep the old ones uh, valid so that old nodes will work in future tools. And how do we do that on the user side? Let us see. So we'll talk just a bit for, about the user side and later we'll just briefly to, to talk tell about the, the developer side, the people who develop tools who may be kindly compatible. So what about the user? So the user may write things like that. 
they may have a certain closure form and attach closure metadata to the form in this way, they say this is markdown in this case, right? But they can also attach metadata to closure values. So not, not the form, which is, you know, the code you evaluate, but the value. So here, for example, we have this function kind MD that attaches to this vector some metadata. So you see, you use kind MD and check the metadata and you see the metadata has this field kind and it says kind MD. So that's it, basically. That's, that's the kind of API. And, you know, some closure values cannot get metadata because they don't implement the necessary uh, uh, interface. But uh, what we do, for example, with a string, which is a value that cannot have closure metadata, we just wrap it in a vector internally so that uh, it gets the metadata and then the tool can, can handle it accordingly. And we will see that in a moment in action. So yeah, we actually did so that did see that. But yeah, anyway, so that's the idea. We just attach metadata. And we can also have these metadata associ associated with certain values by library. So the user doesn't have to bother about it. So for example, maybe we have this library function for making the text big. And here is a function, and you see this function already uses the kind hiccup. Uh, function to say this is hiccup, so it should be rendered as hiccup. And here we have the clay tool doing that. And uh, we can, you know, on the user side at the bottom uh, form, we can see the user side, we can keep processing this resulting big text and change the style. And it keeps working because it already has the metadata saying it is hiccup. And yeah, maybe just for fun, because this slideshow is rendered by clay. Let us render it by clay a different way. So now I press a key binding in Emacs and we render it as a notebook rather than a slideshow. It's the same namespace rendered in a different way. Both ways, they, they went through this uh, publishing tool called Quoto. And, and maybe another time we talk more about Quoto. And yeah, maybe the other way to infer what is the relevant kind is by certain predicates which are running behind the scenes. So for example, images are, you know, are recognized automatically. So, you know, if we have this Java buffered image and it just shows as, as an image and so on. And uh, tablecloth data sets are just displayed as data sets. And another thing to mention is that um, some of these kinds can be nested. So for example, here we have a vector with a few kinds inside and should just work in a nested way. So we have, you know, a markdown and hiccup and so on inside the vector and inside the map and so on. And yeah, here we are nesting different kinds inside Hiccup. And also, portal is a kind. So you can have a portal view, if you like this amazing data navigation tool called portal, a portal view with a few of your kinds, and, and then you can enjoy the portal data navigation and so on. So this is a little taste of the user side, just very briefly about the developer side. Mm -hmm. So I'll go to the other namespace. And this other documentation namespace that will be released this week is about a library called Kindly Advice. Kindly Advice is the thing we add to Kindly so that tools know how to use Kindly. So for example, here we use the Clay tool to render a notebook. So Clay was actually using the Kindly Advice library for advice to know, you know, what kind of thing is this? And Kindly Advice was telling it, oh, this is an image. Because Kindly Advice is where you have those predicates checking. Is it an image? Is it a vector? And so on. And Kindly Advice is meant to be uh, sensible in terms of defaults, but also user extensible. So let us see it in the action just very briefly 
So for example, we have this form here and we can ask for advice. So you see, Kanti advice works on a given context and typically you have your closure form that you are evaluating, but you also have the value resulting from the form and kindly advice would uh, you know, look into each of them if they are present and use the information it has. And if you only have the form, then it will complete the value by evaluating the value. So it has the complete context. So here, for example, what happens if we ask for advice for this form? So, oh, sorry, I should evaluate the namespace. And so we see that's the advice we get. And the advice says, oh, this is kind sick. And, and the reason is that one of the predicates says so. Maybe let us check another one, uh, this one maybe. What would it say? It says, oh, this is the kind vector because the vector predicate says it is a vector and the vector predicate is prioritized over the seek uh, predicate and, and so on. And then you may, you know, you may decide that some things should be inferred automatically. So for example, what if you want a div to be always inferred to be of hiccup kind, right? It makes sense. So that is something that can be added on the user side. So we can add an advisor, never mind about the details at the moment. And we can say, oh, yeah, now this piece of for this little closure form says div. And because it is a div, we can infer it is of kind become. And so that's a little taste of kindly, which is the user facing thing, and kindly advice, which is what tools use from uh, uh, within uh, the uh, for it, like internally and let us just demonstrate the use of the cloud the quote sorry the portal adapter so now i press a key binding in emacs and uh, what it does is sends it sends this value to to portal so portal knows how to handle these values. So here we send a data set and so on, and 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 uh, and hiccup and so on. So things are compatible between clay on the left and portal on the right. And that's the idea. What we are gonna do in the coming weeks is create lots of documentation, uh, you know, uh, notes from our meetings and tutorials and so on. And the idea is that this documentation will may be created by Clay, but will be usable from within Claire and Portal and so on. And yeah, and really thank you to Kira and Timothy for the process going through uh, this uh, project. And we are hoping to use it now in other tools. Thank you. That's great. Thanks so much, Daniel. That's, uh, yeah, I mean, obviously I've seen some of this along the way, but it's, it's uh, exciting to see it kind of all coming together because I think it's like anyone who starts working with data enclosure, you pretty quickly run into like, how do I share this or how do I use this like same data in this other tool or um, that kind of stuff. And so um, this is hopefully a potentially interesting solution to that. Um, so yeah, related, I guess the last kind of few minutes here we can spend on Tim, other Tim's uh, update if you, if you want to, a little bit of stuff about Play kind, it's kind of a related project. Uh, sure, yeah. Um, hi, everybody. <laughs> Again, uh, um, just uh, want to piggyback a little bit on what um, on what Daniel was saying. Um, and uh, just before I get started, uh, you know, a little bit about. Uh, what I work on in, in my daytime is a diagramming app because uh, uh, I like graphs. <laughs> and, and so uh, the kind of uh, diagrams that um, it can make are, are, are really graphs uh, that, that connect information and ideas. Um, but uh, what I want to talk about today is, is uh, really kind of starts with uh, just that I really love books. <laughs> um, I, I love reading. I, I, I love physical books. I, I find that um, they're just, uh, they assist 
with with remembering things because they're like a physical object that that's in space and um i like libraries a lot every time i visit a city or go anywhere i the first thing i do is i visit the local library um because they're often wonderful buildings uh and uh they're just uh super interesting and they're filled with books <laughs> so yeah personally like one of the reasons I, I think it's important is that you can really learn anything and it's an opportunity for people uh to uh yeah to develop knowledge um uh but specifically um about six months ago Kira and Daniel were talking about the closure data cookbook uh that they're developing and uh requested some feedback on on the initial draft and so uh we got chatting and uh talking about the content uh but also that there was this troubling problem of how do you actually set up a project to produce a book um and you know we've got the the age-old problem of well, i want to write this content I want to produce these visualizations. I want to put it together. And it's it's always kind of difficult to keep those in sync. Uh, you know, it, if you're working on a blog post or a book or anything or even a report, um, it, it's a, a challenge. And, and so the solution to that, obviously, is like, let's write it in code. Let's have a namespace, be the notebook. Uh, we'll do literate coding and then everything will be together, it'll be reproducible, it'll be beautiful. Um, and there's some tools available, like we can do Markdown, uh, we can use literate closure like Clark and Clay, uh, we can create visualizations with Kindly. Uh, but um, one, one of the obstacles, like there, you know, when we looked at it, there were lots of obstacles actually, like just how do you actually collate multiple namespaces as chapters into a single book, um, how do you how do you do that? Um, and we ran into a lot of issues with poor performance because everything would be embedded in in a single HTML file. Um, and uh, you know, the options out there mostly had very tool specific code. And when you're working on it, doing doing new versions, you'd get a lot like you'd make a small change. And it, you'd get this huge git diff because it'd be all this embedded stuff that came along with it. Um, so the feeling was, you know, we've got lots of tools, but there's just no complete path um, to, to follow. Um, and just a quick aside about Quarto. Uh, Quarto is a very mature solution for R and Python, and they have a have a clear path for creating books and slides and websites. So we thought, you know, maybe we can make use of that in some way. Um, and and so the idea was like we should just focus on creating a markdown, uh, creating the markdown that's suitable from for Quarto from Clojure. Um, and so uh, we started collaborating on uh, Play Kind, which is just a the idea is just a simpler thing that might be more useful. So we're trying to reimagine what Play could be if we broke it down into modular parts. Um, that were just part of a kindly pipeline. Um, so it's kind of like an experiment playground kind of thing. Um, and, and we didn't want it just to be for data science, uh, like, you know, you should be able to write blogs, reports, do experiments, make documentation, uh, all that sort of stuff. Actually, my one of my favorite visualizations are SVGs. So I, I use it for SVGs quite a lot because, uh, you know, you can iteratively view the SVG as you go and then you can publish it at the end so I, I really like it for that um, uh, and of course I just want to emphasize that it should, it should be code right um, the, you know the problem when you're just collating all of these sort of things is that you know you you lose the source <laughs> like you, you created this chart and then it's gone and someone has a different question and they can't they can't answer it um, and what's really great is when you can have, well, this is the the source that produces the thing right next to the thing. And um, people can choose whether they want to focus on one or the other, and they can they can take your your work and 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 run with it. So uh, the the experiments we did with Playkind 
we were exploring, like uh, we wanted something much more static, just plain HTML, um, not using Clojure Script. So like, uh, for instance, Clark will actually uh, create reagent uh, components for everything in your document. So there's a lot of uh, runtime processing and uh, constructing the end result. Um, and we wanted to kind of uh, make something a bit simpler that just produces HTML. Um, and uh, the other idea we explored was, can our notebook evaluation be just data? Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and the reason that was interesting to us is because we were looking into supporting Babashka uh, because uh, right now, unfortunately, Clay doesn't uh, run under Babashka, and so it's difficult to create a Babashka notebook. Um, we we also were interested in testable notebooks, having a command line, uh, and also supporting GitHub flavored Markdown, uh, just as another use case. Uh, GitHub flavored Markdown, unfortunately, is kind of slightly different from the kind of Markdown that Quarto uses, uh, and it's more restricted, you know, but it's uh, so specifically like you can't use JavaScript and things like that if you're hosting GitHub flavored Markdown on GitHub, but it's super useful because that's the main way that people document their code. Um, and, you know, things like CLJ docs uh, use it. So uh, that's why it's interesting. Um, and, and again, we did, we did, we wanted to avoid embedding resources. So we wanted to reference scripts, images and data. Um, and so, I mean, the good news is we it worked. <laughs> we we were able to. Uh, this is a Babashka notebook. Uh, actually, it's it's an example book that's using Babashka uh, code uh, as the notebooks. And um, yeah, the, I mean, the way we actually did the Babashka stuff is we uh, allowed the evaluation. Um, to happen in Babashka itself, but then we process the results uh, later in Clojure. Um, and this is just to show that, uh, yeah, we also are able to produce GitHub flavored Markdown. Uh, right now, I think it's it's still a little bit limited in, in that I'd love to have where there's a JavaScript kind, it'd be great if we could um, replace that with a JPEG, an image or PNG or something like take a snapshot. So. I think there's more work to be done there, but at least the good news is you can target different flavors of Markdown. Um, and the other, uh, yeah, so maybe to talk a little bit about the uh, data, evaluation as data side of things. So what we realized uh, working on ClayKind um, is that we were able to create a separate library in effect. We haven't released this yet, uh, but it's just called ReadKinds. And all it does is it takes your notebook and uh, exactly like Daniel was demonstrating, it converts uh, all of the code into contexts and it also annotates the kinds. So that's nice. You just get a vector of all the code forms in your um, notebook with the uh, results uh, at, at the kinds. Um, and it also preserves the original source code because it uses closure rewrite, which is uh, often just a useful thing to have. Um, and then there's a kindly render part, which just deals with like spitting out Markdown and HTML, um, and then uh, some glue holding it together. So I'll just recap again uh, a little bit about kindly because I think it's kindly is super important. Actually, I think it's the most important thing of, of what we're talking about. It's a standard for requesting visualizations. It's very straightforward. You just put a little annotation on your thing. Um, and there's a functional API uh, available as well. Um, and it's, it's supported by Clay. Uh, there's adapters for Portal and Clerk. Uh, and this is really cool because like, uh, you know, the, the cookbook that Kira and, and Daniel are working on, you can actually view it uh, in Clerk, you can view it in Portal, uh, or you can view it in Clay. And it's it's just really nice to be able to use it in, in whatever context you work. So. You know, kindly's goals was you know we just want everything to work. We don't want breaking changes. Should be non-intrusive and easy for toolmakers to support. And what we discovered along the way is that 
really, we didn't want any behaviors at all in kindly. Uh, you know, it should just be annotations, and we should never break. Like, so it should be really solid. Um, and kindly advice, on the other hand, uh, is is really useful for tool makers. Um, you know, because there's actually multiple ways to annotate kinds. Uh, there could be nested an an annotations. Uh, and, you know, users might want to add their own kind inference. Uh, we already have some kinds that are inferred, like data sets and that sort of thing. So it's not, it's not a trivial thing, uh, but there is a standard, and this library helps you apply the standard. Uh, and yeah, like for, for notebook users, they only need to depend on kindly. Uh, and actually, they don't even need to depend on that if they want to just use the metadata themselves. But for rendering, they should probably pin a particular version of a tool. And I just want to make the point here that um, they'll depend on a tool version, and the tool would, will depend on kindly advice. So they won't have to know anything about kindly advice, actually. Um, and it should always just work. Um, so uh, read kinds produces data. Um, we haven't released this, but if, if anyone's interested in it, uh, we, we certainly could. Uh, release it. Um, so if you want to see it, it's just in the clay kind source at the moment. Um, uh, but uh, it is important to note, uh, Daniel is also making something called note to test, which is available. And it, that's kind of a nice uh, thing that just checks if anything changed in the evaluation of your notebook, which could happen if you upgrade like a dependency or something like that, you, you want to know about that. So that's another interesting uh, tool. Um, we discovered some things about clay along the way, which is, uh, really everything is a file, I guess, <laughs> uh, and that we can avoid, uh, embedding a lot of things and also that we can decouple the server. So clay has a server to help you visualize things. Um, if you, it'll just open up a browser and show you the thing you're looking at. Uh, but you don't need to use that if you don't want to. If you just want to view the file some other way, that's fine. Um, there was a need to render like a project full of many files or just one single file at a time or a single form. Um, and uh, also uh, using an options-based API is, is a good idea. So uh, what I'm really excited about is, is Daniel's releasing Clay version two uh, shortly. I think he, there's a release candidate now. Um, and it's much more lightweight. So it'll only include JavaScript and only when you need it. So there's much less overhead from previously uh, closure scripts um, was, was causing a, a fair bit of slowdown. Um, and uh, images and files. Uh, images and data are are separate files, and again, this really helps with with page loads. So you'll notice if I mean if you looked at Clay in the past or or Clark in the past, all all of these notebook solutions tend to take uh, you know a couple of seconds to just fire up and get everything showing. Um, Clay version two is super fast; like you load the page and it's it's there, and uh, everything works how. HTML should work. Um, you know, images can come in slower if they need to, but it's it's really nice. Um, and also, there's a separation of the source from the target, which basically boils down to you you don't have all that Git churn uh, anymore, uh, and it's very clear what part should be deployed as the final output. Um, all your project options can be specified in a clay.eden or, or as an argument when you call it. And you can render a project file or form. Uh, and you can choose to serve the file or not. Um, and of course, the most important thing is it supports books, <laughs> which is awesome, <laughs> and slides uh, and websites. Um, so I'll just show the uh, clay API real quick. Um, basically, everything is options. Uh, if you have this Clay Eden file, it might look like this. It's just a map of, of things. Um, and you can also render it with, with this make thing and supply some additional options. And those additional options just get merged on top of the options in Clay.Eden. 
Um, so already this is super useful because you can bind the key in your favorite editor to call this function and just replace uh, the source path with the current file. Um, and this will overlay on top of whatever configuration for your project you have. And so the result is you'll just view one particular file that you're interested in. Uh, so you can view your progress as you're editing. And that's nice. Um, some of the other options you can merge in, you can choose not to show things if you want to just view the file in your IDE or you know some other way. Uh, that's fine. Um, if you want to render multiple namespaces, just provide a vector of, of them. And uh, if you want to just render a single form, uh, you can do that too. And so this is another one that's really nice to bind a, a key to, because now you can just look at one particular form that you're working on at a time, which obviously helps you just focus on what you're currently developing. Um, and uh, yeah, you can choose to use Quarto to produce the final HTML. Uh, if you can, if you want, you can request just the markdown that would be suitable for Quarto, but don't convert it to HTML. Um, you can make slides and you can compile a book, which is awesome. <laughs> um, yeah. So I, I, yeah, what I wanted to say here is just, it's super flexible. Everything's decoupled. Uh, you know, the render, the view, the project, the file, the form, the markdown, the HTML, you can specify exactly what you want it to do. Um, but there's also like some obvious um, key things that you would generally uh, bind to a key or put in your uh, build. Um, notebooks just depend on kindly that you don't have to depend on clay. Um, but if you do use clay, you should probably pin a version in your depend in your dev dependencies um, just so you have a reproducible build that uses the same version um, and of course because it's because it's a file just based on configuration you can also just run it from the command line and get the things you want so um yeah I, I think it's really great what Daniel's made in clay and I feel like we now have this really beautiful path to how you can do literate programming like you just you start your name namespace you explore your question your ideas your data uh, you start interleaving some prose and code tables images and charts and you just make the annotations with kindly visualize them with whatever tools you want use whatever ID you want um, right now you know portal works great play works great clerk works great uh, and then at the end you can actually publish a document um, and uh, what's really exciting is that the people consuming the document can just choose to read the document um, as a book or HTML, or they can open up the code and explore the code and visualize things as they go along. So it's kind of like an interactive document. Um, and they just have so many options, uh, but they're all obvious options. Um, so yeah, I, I want to invite you to please try out uh, kindly, uh, Clay, a uh, kind portal, and and kind quirk. Um, I find them super useful already for making blog posts um, and generally just exploring ideas. Uh, and especially toolmakers, I'd love to uh, invite you to have a look into kind advice and see if it works for you. Uh, if if you feel like there should be some changes or whatever, it's a great time to discuss it. Um, it seems like it's working well for Portal, Clerk, and Clay. So we feel like uh, it should be useful to a lot of other situations as well. Um, and uh, yeah, it simplifies a lot of decisions. Uh, and if if it's useful, maybe look at read kinds. I, this one's probably not as useful, but if it sounds interesting, that'd be great to get feedback on, on, on those as well. Um, yeah. Uh, just once again, like, yeah, I think it's super inspiring to see what Daniel and, and Kira have produced in the cookbook. And it's it's a real demonstration of how we can do literate programming um, uh, and, yeah, publish stuff, <laughs> which is just great. 
Awesome. Yeah. Thanks so much, Tim. There's uh, a lot of exciting stuff going on for sure. Is there, I guess, I guess, first of all, I'll say like, if anyone has to go, obviously we've lost a few. Um, we can always carry this conversation online. Like you can find us all on um, the Closure in Slack or Zulip is where a lot of the data people tend to hang out. Um, but I think we probably have a few more minutes and if anyone wants to stick around and ask any questions or um, stuff yeah. about this. Um, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for this. I would be very happy to um, look at the the cookbook if you have a link to share. Yeah, for sure. I'll post one. I, I'll post it in the chat right now. It's definitely uh, very much a work in progress. It's yeah, yeah. of course. But I'm curious uh, to see how it, uh, how it looks. Bigger project than I than I ever thought. But there's um, a work in progress here, and then I'm hoping in the next couple of weeks, optimistically, um, to get something a little more polished published with this all this Cordo stuff that we've been working on. So. Um, I'll definitely, definitely post updates about that in the various community spaces. So, um, like wherever you heard about this meetup, you'll be able to find future updates about that kind of stuff as well. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Maybe can I add like a brief comment? Of course. Yeah. So, so. These things that Timothy was talking about, a lot of them did grow organically by need and was never complete. And a few of us were using it, but it was incomplete for a long time. And it was driven by need, very much by the cookbook. Uh, by the way, to, to, you know, the cookbook examples were kind of driving a lot of what we realized we, that was missing and just not right. And this recent process in the last few months with, with Timothy, it just helped to just make things right. And, you know, finally, you know, experience closure simplicity because it wasn't, it was complex. And now, you yeah. know, if, if you look into Timothy's slides, everything Timothy was saying, it felt like it was just obvious. And it was this process you know, so inspiring. I don't know how Timothy does it, but that is how it is. Things which are complex just turn into things which are simple and obvious. And and it, mm -hmm. we are just getting to this point and they, this will allow us to, you know, really start very soon, hopefully. Yeah, for sure. I think that's the thing with the cookbook. What I quickly ran into was like challenges around publishing and and sharing things so like um there's obviously lots of, of great tools clerk deserves a huge honorable mention it's it's a great tool but it's it's not necessarily like optimal for for publishing and so there's just it's anyway it's led to a lot of really interesting conversations about this like these different you know there's there's like the live interactive workflow side of things and there's publishing and there's presenting and you know on one hand maybe it's just a sign that like you shouldn't try to do all of them with one tool, but I think we've we've kind of found like an interesting middle ground where you can do, um, yeah, where you can do do a lot, or or at least it's it's very flexible, and so you can kind of accomplish whatever you need without needing to like rewrite your notebooks or like rip out libraries or stuff like that. Um, so yeah, it's been super interesting for sure. For me, anyway. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe maybe it makes sense to to end the recording here then, and um, we can always we can always continue. Uh, and like I said, you can find this online, various places. Um, 